Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And now it's from the call over to Irene Cho. You may begin. Welcome everyone to the second session of the Campus Sustainability Training Series. We are so delighted to have all of you today. Thanks for chatting in your answers while you were waiting for this webinar to begin. We got some lovely responses such as Ireland, Spain, Hawaii, Harry Potter experience in Florida, and those are all great vacation spots. Although we don't have any gorgeous um, beachfront views or cool um, views at the moment, we will try to make the session just as appealing as those destinations so we can all enjoy this webinar wherever we are joining from. So myself, Irene Cho, and Bonnie will, Bonnie are joining you today. We also have special alumni grant, campus grantees, Jackie Keeves from the University of Massachusetts Lowell and Alan Riggs from Snow College. We have invited them to share their wisdom about cultivating partnerships. You will have a chance to hear from all of the speakers throughout the webinar. We extend special welcome to six new participants who are joining after the first session, Alabama State University, University of New Hampshire, San Diego Commun Community College, Texas Southern University, Lipscomb College, and LaGuardia Community College. Welcome to all of you. Since we have some new people joining, before we get started and go over the agenda for the meeting, we wanted to go over some expectations and tech orientations. Let's start with some expectations. This is an interactive webinar, so you'll be asked to share your thoughts and comments. Bonnie is known to call on people if the, the room is silent, so be ready to talk. This is also another platform for all of you to hear about what other grantees are working on and learning, learn from each other. So feel free to reach out outside of the webinar and use this time to learn from each other. Mute your phone line when you're not speaking. You can mute and unmute by pressing star six and please never put us on hold as we don't need to hear your hold music. And yes, we do have homework for each session. Bonnie and I are very mindful of people's time and we didn't want to give any busy work. So we have put a lot of thought into having the homework be resources that you can actually use. So please try to complete homework. We will have time to share homework from session one soon. Next expectation is a no-brainer. We ask you to be respectful of each other. We had no problem with this last time, so let's keep up all the good work. Last but not least, we have invited alumni grantees to share their wisdom with this group, and Bonnie and I have also prepared some content for you, so feel free to ask lots of questions. The chat pod is a great place to type in your thoughts, comments, and questions throughout the webinar, even as the speakers are talking. So we wanted to go over some tech features to help you be fully engaged. Tech issues can happen at any time, so if you experience any technical difficulties, please type your questions at any time into the Q&A pod on the right-hand side side of your screen and Laura and Alfred from the tech team will assist you. You can make the presentation screen large, larger by clicking on the full screen icon located in the upper right hand side of the slide presentation. If you hit the escape button, it'll return to normal view. I know I said this before, but please do not put us on hold as the hold music will play for everyone. To share your thoughts, comments, feedback, or questions regarding the content of the presentation, click on the chat icon on the top right corner of your screen. The chat pod will appear as shown on the slide as you see here. Before you send the chat to the group, please select all participants from the drop-down menu so we can all see your chat. 
You can maximize the chat pod by clicking on the icon that looks like an upside down triangle, as you can see on the slide next slide, and next to the Q&A and participant pods. If you have any technical issues, please chat into the Q&A pod and Laura and Alfred will be able to assist you. Now that we've gone through the tech orientations, let's practice using our chat. Please chat in your caption for this picture. Once again, the chat pod is located right above the Q&A pod on the right-hand side of your screen. Don't forget to select all participants before you send your chat. We want everyone to see your witty, funny captions. If you're having trouble locating the chat icon, please chat into the Q&A section. And let me give some time for people to respond to the, or to come up with some captions for this. Oh, I see that Bonnie chatted. Boy, do I have a case of the Mondays. That's a really cute one. And Kendra said Mondays. Julie said, hmm, let me sleep on it. And Andrew, those Oscars really went long last night. <laughs> I can't agree more with that. And Katie, haha, way to go, Bonnie, amen, that's funny. And Alfred said, meow, Monday, good one. And Teresa said, time for cat nap, haha. <laughs> and Lisa said, uh, mindfulness, yes. And Patricia Smith, TTU, is that a shorthand for something? Maybe I'm, I'm missing it. Yeah, and Alan Riggs said, my drinking is becoming cat A catastrophic. That was a good one. So now that we've um, seen great captions coming in, and yes, Katie said, working on updating the PSI. <laughs> wow. And Toxoplasma Gandhi, here we come. Wow, we have really great captions coming in. So now, Switching gears a little bit, and thank you so much for chatting in. Those were all great captions. Just a reminder, this is a four-part webinar series. We discussed about adopting a sustainability mindset last session. We will be discussing cultivating partnerships today. And please note that we don't have a session during March due to spring break, and we also wanted to give you some time to actually meet with partners to discuss sustainability. And in April, we will resume our series by talking about building momentum and fostering leadership. Our la last session, we will be talking about securing resources or funding. Through the survey monkey registration, a lot of you expressed concerns around securing resources or funding. And we wanted to let you know that we will also be addressing this issue in some capacity during each session. If you have not checked out the Leaving a Legacy report, our first session speaker, Rita Tiber, and other grantees found this extremely helpful, so we encourage you to check it out when you have time. This resource is also listed on the homework tab of the website. So to briefly re recap what we talked about last session, we focus on the concept of adopting a sustainability mindset. By this, I mean suicide prevention leaders and groups should come up with a vision of what they want to have in place when funding ends, and should keep this in mind in every step of the way, including evaluation. This means not just thinking about sustainability when you're developing the program, but keeping it in mind as you carry out activities and as you tweak your program throughout the funding period. We also went over the prioritizing worksheet to help you narrow down which efforts to sustain after the grant. We mentioned this last time, but it is very hard to sustain all activities after the grant, so we recommend you to work with partners to pick ones that are cost-effective and have the most impact. So now jumping into today's agenda, we will discuss, we will discuss what we have been up to since our last webinar and also discuss our homework. 
so be ready to engage in a vibrant discussion soon. Bonnie will go over today's topic of cultivating partnerships for sustainability. Jackie Keeves from UMass Lowell will discuss how she had partnered and continues to partner with violence prevention. And we will go over using communications and data to make the case for sustainability. We have another guest speaker, Alan Riggs from Snow College, to discuss how he used data to make the case for sustainability. We will wrap up with discussions about next steps and going over homework. So that was a lot of talking from my end, so I'll turn it over to Bonnie at this time. Thanks, Irene. Hi, everyone. This is Bonnie Lipton from SPRC. Um, let me um, first apologize because I have a cold, so I have a cold voice right now. Um, but so what I'd love to hear from you guys right now is to tell us what have you been up to since the last call um, that was last, last month, month on January 23rd. Um, what have you guys done regarding sustainability? So um, feel you can either chat it in or you can t uh, tell me. Um, operator, could you unmute the line, please? Certainly. One moment, please. The lines are all open at this time. Hi, everyone. So um, so does anyone want to share what they've been up to? Maybe you talked to your advisory council. Maybe you've uh, filled out the worksheet more um, that we did last time. Any, uh, feel free to chat it in, or you can tell me. Uh, you could speak it vocally. And Irene is going to be typing everyone's answers on the screen so you can see it, because we're high tech. So um, because I am a jerk, I am just going to start calling on people, So, because uh, I don't hear anyone speaking or chatting. Oh, does someone want to say something? Um, so Courtney from DCCD, you said you've been filling out the homework. So, um, so Courtney, has been filling out that worksheet been helpful for you? And you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Hi, Bonnie. This is Courtney Hi. from uh, DCCCD. Um, it really has. Uh, we we actually just started to be very honest, but um, actually putting it down, um, listing it, it kind of got me into the mindset of what we need to do as far as programming and, um, and and making sure that our partners are happy. And not just the things that we want to do, but some, just trying to make sure that we're investing into the things that they want to do as well. And so it really did uh, bring some good ideas uh, into my mind that I really wasn't was not thinking about even while I was just typing. So it was, it was really cool. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm glad it was helpful. Thank you. Uh, Hannah from Oregon State, you said you brainstormed with your wellness team about how to implement long-term strategies for success that don't, won't require funding. And then you also talked about you're trying to work with our student fee committee in order to get a student health position funded after your grant runs out. Can you tell us more about that? And you might have to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, Bonnie. Can you guys hear me? Hi. Yeah, sure can. Great. Um, so we have a student wellness, or we have a wellness team, and we meet every two weeks. And so we're just trying to um, start talking about how we can keep these um, suicide prevention and postman strategies going after our funding runs out. Um, and so we've invited a few students to be on the team, and then our mental health counselor, um, a psychology professor. Um, we started working on that a few weeks ago, and then the next meeting will be this Wednesday, and we're going to come back with, with different ideas, and so I can tell you more after that happens. That's great. So just to clarify, you're going to try to see if you can get some of the student fees used in order to get the position funded? Yeah, we're hoping to get um, a student paid position funded by the student fee committee. Um, and that, that student would be working on, um, I guess, talking with both students and, and professors um, in, in mental health 
um, awareness and suicide prevention. That's fantastic. And we've definitely had other GLS campus grantees do that um, using the student health fee to get a position funded. Um, so I really keep us updated. I really hope that works out. Okay, great. Yeah, I will. And I'd love to speak with anyone else who has had success in getting this, this position funded. Um, we're just looking at finances right now to see how much it will cost and, um, you know, it, in hopes that maybe our grant can fund the first year or match it and then student fees will take over from that. Some, we're trying to come to some sort of agreement. Sure. I know one grantee off the top of my head who did it was UT Martin, sorry, University of Tennessee Martin, um, okay. who, whose grant ended, I think, in 2015. Yeah, in 2015. But that also might be a good question for the listserv. Okay. So great. I'll follow up with you. Great. Um, and then Lisa Thomas Gibson. And Lisa, you were with Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, which, I mean, you knew that. I was just checking to make sure I knew that. Um, you brought the topic up to your student advisory council and executive council, but you need lots of follow-up, though. And you also talk, spoke informally with our vice chancellor for student affairs. Yes. So can you tell me more about what kind of follow-up is needed? I think we just need to structure um, how we're going to move forward. I uh, had followed up with them about this particular training to give them a sense of, of the support that we're getting. Um, so I just think that being able to really sit down and, and uh, uh, put together a plan that's appropriate for our campus is the next step. Great. Okay. Well, keep us updated. Okay. And Katie uh, Simmons, you said that you have um, partnered with District 51 and brought Kevin Hines in and discussed the future of assist as part of sustainability. Can you tell me what's District 51? Uh, district 51 is the school district. Oh, okay. And so, so our, talking uh, with the school district. Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified that. Um, yeah, uh, District 51, the school district has been hit very hard with suicide. There's been about four or five high school student suicides August or September. And so there's a lot of um, activity and coming together on how to address what is this epidemic in our community. Um, and one of them was we uh, helped the uh, through the high school host Kevin Hines. So we provided the space and sort of did logistics as far as where and when, and then they were able to bring Kevin Hines to to the community uh, with a bunch of partners. Um, That's great. Yeah, Kevin Hines is an amazing speaker. I, quite frankly, always get teary-eyed when I hear him speak. Um, he's fantastic. But I am I'm very sorry to hear about uh, that's, um, that, that rash of suicide deaths. Um, and that's wonderful that you're working with the community to tackle that, and it's a real collaborative effort. Uh, but I yeah. wish you didn't have to. I, yeah. Uh, Definitely. And um, Lipscomb, Lipscomb, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. You began implementing a student-led awareness group, You're Not Alone, with the intentions of the group leading awareness event after the grant ends. Fantastic. And you met with the coalition board as well. So, t Diana, tell me more about You're Not Alone. Um, so it's, it sounds like it's a student-led group, and they do, um, like, awareness campaigns and speaker events. Yes, um, let me know, make sure you guys can hear me. We can. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, we um, tried to get the group running last semester, but just we haven't gotten our feet out from under us yet, so we're really trying to get it off the ground um, starting up now. Um, the group itself, it started at, a, at um, Stanford, um, and it is at a couple of other campuses as well. Um, and so we didn't create this idea, but we um, are jumping in with it and excited about it. Um, so far, the, I mean, the grant is, is being able to kind of fund the events that are going to happen through this group. But the hope is that um, after the grant ends, the um, uh, students will you know, start having club dues or, or student dues um, to be able to fund um, the events, but with the purpose of um, both being a kind of a student support group of um, uh, just bringing awareness to mental health in general that a lot of people can struggle with it and that you're not alone in that experience. 
um, but also doing, you know, different, um, like a, a speaker event um, each month um, as well. They're hoping to do soon a, an open mic event on campus where students can come and express, you know, poetry or spoken word or um, songs that are related to mental health or express kind of their experience with mental health. Wonderful. Well, that sounds great. I, you know, I love to hear about those student collaborations. Um, and I, I hope to hear more about it next time that it's going well. Yeah, and thank you. I, <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for talking. I didn't have to call on anyone, which makes me happy. And now I'm going to turn it over to Irene. Um, oh, wait, can I tell you guys something real quick? That's my cat, Athena. I thought that was really important for me to tell you that um, in this picture. <laughs> and now I'm going to turn it over to Irene to talk about the homework. Um, thank you, Bonnie. Um, so for homework, we have asked you to look at step four of the collaboration module from the virtual learning lab and also complete the engaged partners consistently and creatively worksheet. I know it has been a month since we met, so I, I will remind you what the worksheet was about. So hope this worksheet rings a bell for you. And I know Courtney mentioned a little during our um, discussion earlier, but did any, um, who can tell us about what it was like completing this worksheet? You can chat in or just, um, just say vocally as your lines are all open. I'll give folks a little bit of time to just think back before I start calling on people. Okay, so um, Courtney, I know that you already like completed the homework. So um, could you like elaborate a little more about um, what were some ways you've kept partners engaged in the past or now? Um, yes, when when we uh, started out, we wanted to we, we wanted to just honestly we just wanted to get through the project to make sure that everything was going the way it needs to go. To start off, we started out a little late, so um, we were just trying to get everything going. But now our focus is uh, is that sustainability piece that you're talking about, and one of our partners um, is actually Human Resources, uh, where we can have professional development credit assigned to um, to our presentations and things like that so that faculty and staff will buy in, they'll get more information as well as some kind of <laughs> which is that uh, which is that credit which is required. Um, another thing that we're trying to work with with HR is making um, the at risk online module mandatory. Um, we wanted to make sure that it's not you know, we pay for this we want to make sure that we had enough um, we had enough participation so that we can sustain the suite um, after after our uh, grant ends, and so that was one, another thing that we're working on. And actually, we've we've got gotten one thumbs up. We're trying to make sure that uh, we get our foot in the door with with our uh, was the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning um, coordinator, so that we can also take it to our AVP, which is a uh, um, associate vice president. Um, so that she can approve it and say that it's good to go. So that's one of our partnerships that we have that will work. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And I, I really love your um, collaboration with HR. And also we had some other um, grantees even on this call, like trying to think about how to make the like at-risk online module like mandatory, like not only that, but gatekeeper training for faculty. So I feel like this uh, platform can be a great way to kind of brainstorm ideas and just um, toss back different ideas. And did any, um, did anyone else besides Courtney want to chat in or share anything about the homework? Okay, due to um, some time, um, we, um, I will just um, wrap this up and turn it over to Bonnie at this time. Hi, everyone. And um, operator, you can go ahead and mute the phone lines. Um, so, oops. So today we are talking about cultivating partnerships for sustainability. Um, so 
when you guys filled out your member profiles for us, and just as a reminder, if your campus has not yet filled out a member profile, you can still send it to me. Let me know. Uh, just uh, I can send you the email template. So I thought it would be helpful to just, you know, kind of see who everyone has partnered with. So starting with students, we have Active Minds, Campus Newspaper and Radio, LGBTQ Student Orgs, Peer Counseling Programs, Sororities and Fraternities, and Student Government. So, but I wanted to hear from you guys, other than, um, so other than what's on the screen, what are some other student groups that you've partnered with? And you can just chat that in. So chat in any other student groups that you've partnered with. Um, I don't know if anyone's partnered with, say, like a NAMI student. Oh, Tracy Meyer, you read my mind. You partnered with NAMI University of Louis Louisville? Great. And Katie Neff partnered with TRIO. Katie Neff, can you tell me more about what TRIO is? Chat that in. Katie Simmons, you, um, Colorado Mesa, partnering with NAMI on campus and Psych Club. Camille Vega from Truckee Meadows, our Campus Veterans Resource Center. Wonderful. I love that. And then um, Andrew from Lipscomb, uh, not Lipscomb, Ohlone, sorry, Andrew, School of Nursing, and Diana uh, from Liscom, working to partner with the Psy, Psychi Psychology Club. Um, Lisa Thompson Gibson, Mental Illness Awareness Support Group. Sorry, Alliance, out of School of Nursing. You guys are typing so fast, the screen's going really fast, which is wonderful. Uh, Camille from Chucky Meadows also said student workers on campus, including financial aid. Uh, Hannah said OSU Cascades Research Club and Kinesiology Club. Oh, you know, you don't usually hear about people partnering with the Kinesiology Club, Hannah. That's really cool. Marty Thompson from Clemson said Psychology Club. Katie Neff said currently enrolled students may be eligible for the TRIO Student Support Services Program at Eastfield if they are first-generation college students or economically disadvantaged or have a disability. Thank you, That's re I was curious about that. That's great that there's outreach to those groups um, because we know they might be more at risk. And Wendy from Sierra said applied art and design departments. Marty Thompson from Clemson said transfer students. Fantastic, well that is a really great group of students to partner with. And Tracy Meyer said SAB, Student Activities Board, Kent School of Social Work, Med School, Reach Ambassadors, and Kendra said first year students. So this is a good transition to um, partnering, what kind of faculty and staff groups are you partnering with? Um, so we have academic advisors, campus security, clergy, counseling center, disability office, health services, international center, sexual assault prevention, residence life, and veterans and ROTC programs. What are some other faculty and staff departments, people, that you're collaborating with? So, of course, some of the people you've already said, like, say, the psychology club that, you know, has faculty, staff, and students. But um, what about faculty, staff only groups um, have you been partnering with? I'm sure there's much more than on this list. So please chat that in. So I, Camille from Truckee Meadows says Fitness Center. Regina from LaGuardia Community College. Hi, Regina. Health Sciences faculty and staff. Katie from Colorado Mesa says Tutoring and Educational Access Services. That's great. Kathy Zakhan from Pennsylvania College of Technology. I hope I got that name right, Kathy. Athletics. I mean, I know I got your name right. I hope I got the college name right. Camille from Truckee Meadows says Equity and Inclusion Office. Very important. Camille Vega said human resources. I believe someone else also said human resources earlier as well. They're a very par important partner to work with, um, and they're especially helpful in, you know, kind of having the carrot and stick and making people do trainings. Courtney Pickens said art and communication and social work department. Um, I have a question. Is anyone working with the alcohol and substance abuse departments on their campus? Any collaborations there? You can chat in or um, anyone working with, say, um, the nursing school. I don't think I saw the nursing school yet, unless I did and I missed it. 
you guys have been typing pretty fast. Oh, you know, Andrew from Maloney did say the nursing school. Thank you. Sorry, Andrew. Um, Tracy said we partner with BRICC, which is the Alcohol EDU. Fantastic. Katie Neff said, yes, we have an LCDC program, which follows under our social science division. Andrew said, yes, we partner with nursing. Sorry, Andrew, you said that earlier and I missed it. Regina said, the health sciences department encompasses the nursing PTA and OTA program. Great. I'm guessing physical PTA is physical therapy and OTA is occupational therapy. Let me know if that's not right. And Kendra says, we'll be partnering with our nursing students in April. Fantastic. And Tracy says athletics. Yes, they are an important partner. So now transitioning to off-campus partners. So here are some off-campus partners you guys have mentioned. Um, alcohol and substance abuse treatment centers, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Chapters, local health departments and suicide prevention coalitions, crisis phone and text lines, domestic violence shelters, hospitals, mental health clinics or providers in the community, and NAMI, is there anyone else on there um, that I've missed that people are partnering with? Please chat it in. Tracy says, One Love Louisville Mental Health Advisory Board. Great. Anyone else? Um, I wonder, uh, Camille from Truckee Meadows says, Veterans Health System State Suicide Prevention Office, State Coalition for Suicide Prevention, and Native American Health Centers. That is fantastic. I would love to hear that you're partnering with the state, Camille. Um, and I love that you're partnering with Native American Health Centers. And you know, for those of you in states uh, where there is a large Native American population, don't forget that there are tribal GLS grants. And maybe you can partner with some tr tribal GLS grantees. And you can see a list of those names on the uh, SPRC website. Camille is also partnering with local universities. Wendy is partnering with the California Community College Foundation office. The California Community Colleges are a force of nature. You guys partner so well together. And Regina said, collaborating with the New York City Mental Health Service Corps, <coughs> pardon me, this program is a key initiative of Thrive New NYC, Roadmap for Mental Health for All. Tracy's partnering with the Kentucky State Grant. I love it. And Camille's partnering with local law enforcement. Fantastic. Well, so that is great. And the reason why I had to see that is I'm hoping that it gave all of you some good examples. And it's a good way to shine and show what everyone is doing. So we're talking today about partnerships. Now, first of all, clearly you guys are already doing so much with partners. Um, so this isn't, this topic isn't to say, hey guys, you should partner with people because you're already doing that. It's more talking about things like talking with your partners about what grant goals to continue and using data to show that to them and getting input from partners about unmet need, what are their concerns once the GLS program ends, what are their thoughts about student mental health on campus, and then also how to assess the existing partnerships, what's being heard and what is needed. So one of the things you probably saw in the module is, you know, what communication efforts can you use to keep your partners engaged? And we talked about using one-on-one -on -one emails, in-person meetings, having large group events, e-newsletters, social media, and trainings. Uh, one grantee would hold a annual meeting once a year on the campus and invite faculty, staff, and students. It was right after graduation, so people were always very happy and in a good mood, and they would talk about what they've accomplished so, year, so far that year in the grant, or they'd bring in a speaker to talk, say, about Title II considerations, um, or they'd have a student speaker, and they'd serve food, which is probably the key thing. And it was a good way of pe keeping people uh, updated. Also thinking about how often should you communicate with partners, whether it's a weekly, monthly, bi-monthly, biannually basis or as needed. And then also thinking what to do with priorities change. And the module had a really good example of this. And I think this is a very true strategy or uh, 
um, very accurate issue for many campuses these days um, that, you know, the wellness center and suicide prevention programs collaborated in the past, but due to several recent sexual assaults, the wellness center is now focusing on sexual violence prevention. So suicide prevention people were worried that that meant they couldn't collaborate anymore, but that's not the case because they talked with the sexual violence prevention people and they saw that they're providing sexual assault bystander trainings. And this is a similar goal to suicide prevention, encouraging bystanders and peers to take action if they see someone at risk of a sexual assault. So they were able to partner together on bystander trainings. So that's just an example of something you can do when priorities change. Um, we know many grantees have prioritized with alcohol and drugs um, and other groups on campus for suicide prevention. And then, of course, strategies for sustaining partnerships off campus. Those are often hardest because you're not seeing them. Uh, one thing everyone, uh, one strategy we recommend is a memorandum of understanding with a hospital uh, to formalize everything. That's one good way of sustaining. Another is, again, communication. Uh, having a event on campus where you invite off-campus providers to come in and advertise, having a thank you event for them, holding in-person meetings, just talking on the phone with them every few months. How's it going? How's it going seeing our students? Things like that. It definitely takes time uh, to keep those partnerships engaged, as you well know. And then thinking about who's missing from the table. Um, so, uh, can anyone, so you've just seen a list about of different partners um, that other people are partnering with. Does anybody want to chat in who um, they, after seeing this list, that they're going to reach out to? You can chat it in or a call on you. Camille from Truckee Meadows says, we have challenges with the local for-profit hospital. Camille, can you chat in what kind of challenges you're having? Um, you know what? Um, so because I'm not seeing a lot of chatter here, which is fine. Oh, Lisa said, I'd like to see human resources on our campus. We tried to reach out, but it's been a bit difficult to get on the same page so far. Haven't given up, though. I like to see that. Regina from LaGuardia said, new immigrant support services due to our large ethnic population. Great. And Kimberly Smolin said, private counseling offices in town. So we're going to come back to the, oh, and Camille said the Asian and Muslim community. So we're going to come back to talking about reaching out to these people with our challenges, and we're going to move on right now to our speaker, Jackie Keeve. Um, now, um, so back to me. I'm, now it's my pleasure to introduce our alumni grantee, Jackie Keeves from University of Massachusetts Lowell. Jackie, thank you so much for taking the time to join the webinar today. Before I give you some time to introduce yourself and take introduce yourself and your campus, I wanted to remind everyone that we will have some time to ask questions at the end. So feel free to chat in your questions, comments, or thoughts throughout the presentation, and we will ad address them after the presentations. Now you can take it away, Jackie. Great. Thank you so much. There we go. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm trying to get myself together now. Um, so I guess um, I just wanted to initially introduce myself. Um, I was our project or program coordinator for our grant that ended uh, last June, I think just this past June. We had it for three years and then we had a no-cost extension, so it was just over four years that we had our GLS grant um, and I was with it um, from the start, not from the writing process, um, but from the start of once we received funding. Um, and I've been at UMass Lowell for about uh, six years now, 
um, and I've been in a variety of different departments and different areas doing a number of things, but currently I'm the Assistant Director for Violence Prevention. Um, I'm a mental health clinician, uh, and I've been in this position for about two years now, and I'll talk a little bit about what my position is all about. Um, um, but my, I guess, kind of the general overview of what I do, um, my job is to focus on outreach, programming, and education for both sexual violence and suicide prevention, hence the title of violence prevention. Um, I also oversee a group of peer educators uh, that are kind of a sidestep of my work, uh, and I'm also our on-campus victims advocate. And this is all pretty new work to our campus. Um, and just kind of a little snippet of what our campus is, if you're not familiar with UMass Lowell. Um, we are, uh, a lot of people will refer, will refer to us as a decentralized urban campus because we're in the middle of a city, uh, we kind of have three different sections of our campus where we have residential housing, we have academic buildings, um, and there's been a lot of growth within the past few years. So what I broke down for people to kind of get a sense of is the difference between uh, when we first received our funding uh, to some numbers from last fall, fall of 2015. Um, Although when I ran these numbers past some other professionals, um, I was told that these aren't correct and our residential community is significantly greater than that, so I'm not really sure what is accurate these days. Um, but I know that our growth really um, kind of changed a lot of our work because I'm sure every other campus is experiencing the same thing. You have growth of students, but not necessarily growth of staff and funding. <laughs> so trying to kind of monitor all of that. Mm -hmm, absolutely, Jackie. Um, now that we've heard a little bit more about you and your campus, can you tell us more about how the partnerships form between the suicide prevention and violence prevention efforts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it's important to understand our initial grant request um, had focused on general suicide warning signs. Uh, it stemmed from us experiencing a number of losses within one semester. We had about six or seven, or seven sudden deaths, um, and that's kind of what stemmed the push to say, hey, we need to address this. Uh, we need to better understand what to look for and know what the resources are. And as the um, proposal developed, uh, they were looking at highlighting some high-risk groups, and they talked about veterans, uh, and students uh, with disabilities. But there were a number of years between the initial grant proposal and when we received our funding. And within that time frame, there was a lot of change on our campus and a lot of greater understanding for who our students were and what their needs were. Um, and we saw, um, sorry, um, we saw that there was a greater need with our LGBTQ students. Um, sexual violence at that point was becoming a higher priority for the government, uh, which was coming down on the university as a whole. Um, so we really took a step back and looked at what we were doing and said, okay, yes, we're looking at suicide um, as a kind of our umbrella topic, um, but there are all these other pieces underneath it that we need to be addressing. So we really looked at it as this kind of all-encompassing program, um, hence our campaign, You Matter at UMass Lowell, and the one conversation can save a life. That tagline actually came from Kevin Hines' story. Um, and so the sexual violence um, work, which really came into play, um, like I mentioned, that was really a big push um, that a lot of institutions have been receiving from the government, um, from Title IX and um, the Dear Colleague letter coming out in 2014. Uh, and I don't want to assume that everybody knows what that was, but that was offering guidance on how you should be um, dealing with sexual violence on your campus. And so as we were kind of taking steps back and looking at that and making sure that we were doing things the way we're, we're supposed to, we were simultaneously looking at our grants coming to an end and saying, well, we've come up with all of these great sustainable programs. 
like trainings and things, but who's going to actually continue them? In theory, they all will run, but there has to be a centralized person to do them. Um, and so in order to kind of take care of all of these needs, um, my current position was created. And so it was looked at as though this position could kind of take care of all of this because in the end it all wrapped together because we looked at it in a way that you can't address sexual violence without addressing mental health and suicide prevention um, because of the high risk that comes with victims of sexual assaults. And you can't address suicide without addressing all of the major risk factors underneath, which again encompass sexual assaults. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, oh, sorry. Go. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you um, so much for sharing. And obviously, the dear colleague letter greatly helped in building momentum. But can you share a little bit more about some key elements that helped you to successfully sustain this partnership beyond the GLS grant? There we go. Um, <laughs> a lot of our direct uh, suicide prevention. Um, efforts um, continued on, for example, in RA training. We have training for our residential advisors every um, August. And so we had started by, you know, they invited me in to do a talk on mental health and suicide prevention. And then our reporting from our RAs increased so significantly. And so this became an annual piece of their training where we did our uh, we use a three-hour training called Connect through NAMI New Hampshire, and that's part of their training now every year. And again, I think the ongoing piece of that came from seeing the rise in reports from RAs. Um, we've seen a rise in reporting from faculty and staff in this, um, and I think a lot of that comes from getting information out to them. And I know there was a, a couple of times it was mentioned partnering with HR, which I think is a great, great thing. Because uh, it's really tough to reach faculty. It's impossible to reach faculty, for us at least. Um, and so we had created uh, these red crisis folders. Um, and I had gotten the idea and I kind of tweaked it off of, I think, a school in Texas. Um, and initially it was this very low cost, kind of I bought these red folders and printed things out and tucked them away and sent them out via inter-office mail. And we got some great recognition at, um, in a TIXA conference where our associate vice chancellor was. And he looked at them and he said, well, why aren't we doing this in a more productive manner? And he gave us some funding to kind of create some more high quality versions of them. And we were then able to partner with our human resources department where now all new faculty and staff meet with them for a one-time um, meeting to discuss benefits and things like that where they receive our red folder. And it encompasses kind of warning signs, resources, um, kind of all the basic things that we want people to know coming into campus. Um, and we'll be revamping that this summer to include a page about sexual violence as well. Um, yes, so um, thank you so much for sharing all the great successes you have with the REA training and the red folders and all of that. But I was just wondering from the current grantees' perspective, they might be interested in hearing more about what were some challenges you faced in sustaining this partnership and how you overcame some of them. Yes, oh, absolutely. It sounds all nice and easy, um, but there's not at all. I think. Um, one of the challenges that I face on an ongoing basis is, um, well, one, people not understanding what violence prevention is, um, because it is a very generic role, a title, an office. Um, and so when they see that, they either think of something, you know, that I focus on physical assault or things like that, or the automatic assumption for many people, including staff that I work with, um, on a regular basis, uh, start to think that my work focuses solely on sexual violence. And again, I think that comes from all of the mandates from uh, the government and then the kind of hesitations on the campus where, you know, are we checking our boxes and, you know, let's make sure that, you know, 
Jackie is doing this and our conduct is office, office is doing that. So always remembering about the sexual violence piece, but sometimes forgetting about the suicide prevention work as well. Um, and I think the biggest piece um, for everybody uh, is always time. You know, the more you get the word out there, the more students will come forward, um, and then the less time you have to do other things. So it's kind of the catch-2020 piece. Um, and again, because part of my role is as a victim's advocate, um, I often have students coming to me mainly with sexual violence issues, um, but also with suicidal ideations, um, and so kind of balancing the need to be meeting with these students one-on-one, -on -one, but still providing the education and the outreach on campus um, and making sure there's communication between different departments that needs to be happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Those are some great challenges that are common across all GS GLS campus grantees, so thanks for highlighting them. And before we open up the floor for a question, I, the last question will be, um, how did you communicate with your partners to help you continue to get their buy-in beyond the grant? Um, I think we, or I guess I should say, I really focus on just the ongoing communication, making sure that I continue to be in touch with all of the partners that I built throughout our grant, um, and whether that's Res Life, um, you know, outside of the annual RA training, checking in and, you know, saying, you know, hey, what's going on in the halls? Is there something that you need? Um, we've created a sexual violence prevention committee, um, which is great, you know, for the sexual violence piece, but a lot of times now the conversation can lead to how there are larger issues at hand. Um, I think you had talked about bystander training at some point, or somebody had mentioned it, um, but that's a really great piece because you can encompass so many different areas with that. And with that, we're using um, Greek life to communicate. We're using our Office of Student Activities. We're communicating with conduct to kind of keep everybody up to date. Um, really basic tool that I've done is um, posters for events uh, or informational posters. Um, we not only send out through the normal routes of kind of putting them on walls, in the halls and things like that, um, but certain faculty and staff members that I developed relationships with, I make sure that they get posters via inter-office mail and electronically, so I know that they're also sharing them. So it's just kind of more routes to get the information out. Um, and students are really my biggest thing. Uh, like I said, we now have a peer education group that focuses on these topics. Um, uh, somebody mentioned a student worker as well, which um, I recently got this past semester, um, and so I communicate with her a lot about what she sees on campus, where she sees the needs, and she's a huge assistant to me as well. Um, so I think just kind of keeping the conversations going, whether they're passive conversations while you're grabbing coffee, or kind of these formal sit-downs or committees. Those are all great um, communication strategies that all of the grantees can definitely utilize. And I was one, I, now I want to open up the floor for any questions for Jackie. Um, operator, could you please open up the lines for everyone? Certainly, one moment, please. Mm -hmm. You can also chat in your questions. So um, we will take one or two questions, and um, you don't get this chance every day. So feel free to speak up. Minds are opened at this time. So I bet everyone's wondering, oh, about the funding issue. So I know, Jackie, you briefly touched upon it, but could you like elaborate a little bit more about how you secured the funding with Title IX? Sure. Um, so I think uh, some of that I certainly can't speak to because that was, those were discussions with our upper administration outside of my hands. Um, but kind of, um, 
again, a lot of it came from the pressure of making sure that we were um, following through on all of the mandates um, and knowing that there are just the current staff members couldn't have possibly have done that all. Um, it certainly helped because we do have a good relationship with our local rape crisis center. They happened to connect with our chancellor and say, you know, hey, what are you doing about all of this stuff, you know, in Title IX and sexual violence? And that kind of lit a fire and started some questions, which was certainly helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. And I just want to give one more chance for anyone who would like to ask a question to Jackie. So I know this is a great opportunity and Jackie, would it be okay for grantees to contact you directly if they have any other questions or um, any, like, any feedback from you? Oh gosh, absolutely, absolutely, anytime. Okay, yeah, then um, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom with this group. Um, I'm sure this is like super helpful and feel free to um, chat in any questions as you stay throughout the webinar. And at this time, um, operator, would you mind closing the lines for us? And um, I'll turn it over to Bonnie Lipton. Thank you. Lines are back on listen only. Thanks so much, Jackie. And um, we do have Jackie's email on the contact slide at the end. It would have made more sense if I had it right here, but it's at the end, so you have to say to the end to see it, or we could just email it to you. So we're going to briefly talk about communication, especially communicating with your partners. <clears throat> um, and thinking about what do you want your partners to do as a result of, your communi of these communications, and how will, they, how will this change contribute to your sustainability goals? So would it be more funding? Are you trying to communicate with them to partner on future activities, committing to reducing stigma? And what's the best way to communicate with different partners? And it's different for every campus. Um, one example from a grantee is uh, they took part in the Healthy Mind study, which is this wonderful study where you get a lot of data about your campus and you can um, compare it to national data. And so they were very excited and they decided to share it with all, the, all their key partners, which was about 60 people. And so they printed it out, like the executive summary is about six pages and they put it in one of those binder things with the clear cover. And they sent it out in, in our office mail to go into everyone's mailbox. Well, you might be able to guess what happened. It's that nobody read it because on this campus, nobody was checking mail anymore or it was just one more thing to read. So later on, the grant team realized what would made more sense would be to have emailed or set up in-person meetings, maybe group meetings with different partners to go over the results. So like I said, it is different on every campus. And briefly, I want to talk about the framework for successful messaging or safe messaging. Now, this is more for awareness campaigns, but so even though communicating with your partners isn't really like an awareness campaign, it's important to use safe messaging, especially when communicating with students and other individuals at risk. And you'll also want to teach your champions to use safe messaging in their communications. For example, one grantee, there was a student suicide attempt and the president sent, sent a message out about it encouraging people to get help, which was fantastic. We were really happy to see that. But his message used terminology like suicide is endemic among those in the typical college age group and I don't want to lose any more students to this epidemic. Well, epidemic is actually an unsafe word and he meant well. But, you know, you're inadvertently reinforcing the stigma when you make those sort of comments about suicide, such that, like, suicide is inevitable among college students. You don't want to do that. So that's an example of talking to your partners about safe messaging. Another way to make your case is about data, um, showing why this work is important. Uh, and, that can, and our next speaker, Ellen Riggs, has a great example about this. But also remember to use a positive narrative and be careful with statistics. Now you're going to be saying to me, but Bonnie, we love statistics. We're at a college. This is all we do. 
But well, so statistics is important. You want to think about your audience. So, for example, when communicating with your university president, you'd want to be candid about the four-week wait list to see a provider at the counseling center in order to advocate for more staff members. But you wouldn't want to share this with student partners because it might make them feel like it's pointless to access counseling center resources, and then they won't refer their student friends to counseling. So better statistics for students would be something like, did you know one in four students at our college utilize the counseling center? That's great. We want more students to use counseling. What are your suggestions on how we can make that happen? So that's an example of some statistics that have sort of a positive narrative. And then also think about using champions. So a champion is someone in your community, well-known, respected, who will champion your cause, such as the dean of students, president, community leaders, veterans association, LGBTQ center director, student government, fraternities, sororities. There's lots of different people. So hopefully that gave you some food of, for thought. And now I'm going to turn it over to Alan Riggs from Snow College. He is a grantee that finished in uh, two, 2015, I believe, and he's going to talk about how he's used communication and data to um, advocate for sustainability. Take it away, Alan. Okay. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And um, on the screen, you'll notice that I've got a picture of our campus. Uh, on the left is our administration building. And on the right is our uh, bell tower, just kind of a, an example of some of the beauty of our campus. In the center, you notice that there's a, a, that's our dormitory right there, one of our dorms. And there's a herd of sheep going down the road. Uh, apparently, a rancher decided on a homecoming day to move his sheep from one field to another and took it right down the street the main street of our campus. So those are some of the things that we deal with that are interesting on our on our campus. Um, we do have two campuses. Um, our main campus is in Ephraim, Utah, and we have a second one in Richfield, Utah, about 45 minutes away. So uh, when I sent in my uh, information for my slides, I had a really small picture of myself that was really fuzzy, so nobody could really see it. But apparently the grant Grant folks had uh, another access to another photo, so <laughs> this is a lot better. Um, anyway, I'm the director of the Counseling and Wellness Center and uh, former project director of the Garrett Lee Smith Memorial uh, Grant for our campus. And yes, we did finish in 2015. Okay, uh, just a little bit uh, about our demographics. Um, we're a public institute of higher education. We have the two rural campuses, as mentioned. And we have uh, 4,779 students, all undergraduate, and, uh, and that's between both of our campuses. Uh, about 500 of those students are on our southern uh, campus. And uh, on that campus, they do, uh, they have some certificate programs such as uh, welding and uh, machining, diesel mechanics, and some other programs that way. And we also have a, a nursing program. Uh, and it does not count, that number does not count our um, concurrent high school enrollment students. Okay, so talking about some of our sustainability efforts, we uh, developed a master plan, as I'm sure all of you have. And this is just a portion of that plan um, that kind of talks about this part of the the sustainability effort. And so three of our main goals were that the college would pay for a full-time prevention coordinator and we'd combine that as into an office manager position. And so prior to this time, um, there was just one uh, employee in the Counseling and Wellness Center um, and that was myself as, a, as the counselor and prevention person and everything. And then we were able to eventually go to an additional half-time person, to an additional full-time counselor, and then uh, eventually able to get the prevention coordinator position filled. Um, so the second one is that we'll increase the budget for prevention services. As you all know, prevention is a, a mandated uh, service on college campuses, uh, especially drug and alcohol and uh, sexual assault prevention. <clears throat> 
And then the college will increase the part-time therapist position to a full-time, as I mentioned before, uh, which they did actually right as the grant got started. Um, and so one of our methods for accomplishing this would be to create partnerships with on-campus departments and off-campus resources. And our primary focus here was to stay visible with all of these departments um, and all of the, the people uh, off campus as well. And it's pretty common that the counseling center on campus can be uh, low, low visibility because of the confidential nature of the services. Um, but we're also the prevention area as well. And so because of our small numbers, we do a dual role there. And so we wanted to stay visible, and we wanted to stay visible in a way that was positive and that was um, that professors and staff members saw us as offering something to them rather than asking something from them. And the things that we offered, of course, um, were assistance in how to deal with some of the challenges that students can present. And so the, the number one strategy on that uh, area was that we provided QPR training. And so we had selected the question, persuade, refer program as our, uh, as our method for instructing staff members and faculty on how to, to reach out to students and how to have proper conversations that would be helpful and how to get them into services if they needed it as well. One of our other goals was to train 100% of the residence life assistants and directors. And so we were able to accomplish that. And we do a training um, every August, as I'm sure a lot of you do, with, with those key student workers. And we find a lot of the challenges that we deal with with mental health issues come from on-campus housing. They probably exist, I'm sure, in off-campus housing as well. And we're, we're able to get some of that, but we're not able to reach out to them as easily as, as we can on campus. Um, and we also gave them that the specific QPR training. So, all right, then the next step was that we trained the Dean's Council and other administrators in the QPR method. And so um, one thing we were thinking is that, that the administrators, the deans, you know, vice presidents on up through the president um, were, were probably instructing their people that they supervise on how to deal with challenging situations that students come up with. And so we figured we would uh, advertise this or promote this to them as a way to give them some information so that they could, could share that with their supervisees. And it was something that um, was was pretty badly needed because a lot of times prior to this um, we would get reports you know occasionally that there was a problem with a student in a class but nobody had ever got that information to the counseling center and so this was one method of of speeding up that process and making it happen um, we had a uh, somebody previously had spoke about having uh, you know additional uh, suicides on in one area of their, <clears throat> excuse me, of their work. And we have on our southern campus, um, in that community, we had um, quite a few suicides happen, you know, right back to back. And uh, during that time, the one of the county commissioners from that county contacted me at the office here because they were aware of our suicide prevention grant. And even though only one of the suicides had been a student who had just enrolled but hadn't attended yet, um, there was just a, a big uproar in the community and people were concerned about what was going on. And so they asked us to partner with them, which we did. And there's a lot of things we partnered with them on. But one thing is we had, at the time, we had uh, Kevin Briggs coming to speak to us. And he, many of you may know, was the officer on the Golden Gate Bridge that worked with a lot of individuals who were um, about to commit suicide and was helpful in talking many of them down. Um, and because of this, the unique situation, we were in contact with Kevin Hines as well, as it sounds like most everybody has used Kevin in that regard. Um, and Kevin had already been to our campus the year before, so 
uh, he agreed actually to come and speak with Kevin Briggs. And so we had both Kevins. It was a phenomenal experience. And we moved the venue to our southern campus. It was originally planned for, um, for our Ephraim campus. And so we moved it there, invited the community, and filled up the entire concert hall there on, the, on that campus. Uh, which you know was about 800 people, and for our for our numbers, that's uh, phenomenal because we're such a small community. And it also gave we had a brand new uh, college president that year who uh, he had just barely started, and we were trying to mend some relationships with the college and the community, and this was a great opportunity to uh, let the the president be visible, and so he was the person that introduced the speakers um, at at this event. Okay, and so one of the ways that we decided to reach out to students um, was through a support line. And so this support line was run by um, trained students that received training on some counseling skills, um, but we were clear to emphasize that they were not counselors and that they were there to provide support. And we were able to use um, phone, uh, text, and chat. And what we did was establish this in October of our second year in the grant. And so you'll see some statistics in a minute that will show you how, how that went. The idea was to uh, conduct prevention services over the phone, and, but have it be a method that somebody could contact us anonymously. And we figured since a lot of the students use text and chat already that it might be a great method to use. Um, it was advertised, the, the support line was advertised on our campus TV monitors that are placed around campus in visible areas. And then we developed some refrigerator magnets that were shared on and off campus. Um, and we gave it to all the housing units and off-campus housing it, units at the first of the fall semester. Um, and then we ask uh, through email to have all the professors and staff promote the line. And many of the professors put it in their syllabus that there was help available for people that are struggling or uh, dealing with challenges. And then, of course, the support line has the backup of a licensed therapist. Um, and during that time, it was me pretty much that did that backup. And we've had to look at some things since that time to, to help support that because uh, it's been pretty busy. Um, let's see. All right, so here's some of the, the data. And one of the reasons that this slide is important and some of the other data that will follow this is that we constantly shared this data with um, supervisors. So my direct supervisor, the vice president of student success, and the other vice presidents and the president and the dean's council. And so we wanted to you know, do outreach to these isolated students and give them a place that they could speak openly without concern about having to come in to talk to a counselor if it wasn't necessarily needed. Um, interestingly enough, as I mentioned, we started in October. Um, and You'll see there the, the numbers, uh, but 123 students contacted our center, uh, our support line, uh, during that first year from October through April. And then you can see the numbers steadily increased. So we had a, a 181 at the end of the next year, which was the end of our grant period, I believe, if I'm seeing that right. And then we had 240 at the end of the next year. And this year, currently, we're at 184, um, and that's gone up actually quite a bit since I put the number in. And so we anticipate being quite a bit higher than last year. And so a pretty steady increase in the students that are using the, um, you know, the phone and the tax, texting and chatting. And so one of the other things that we do with that chat line is that we, um, we run it from 7 to midnight, 7 p.m. to midnight. Um, daily through the fall and spring semesters only. And after hours, we forward the phone to the National Call Center. 
And so if somebody calls our line not realizing that we aren't open at that time, it goes to the National Call Center. Okay. All right. And so another thing that we did, because the Counseling Center and Prevention Services are, are together here in this one office, we put together slides about the usage of the counseling services. And uh, we were able to show that we were able to, you know, increase our numbers each and every year. And so, um, unfortunately, this number or this slide got butchered a little bit because of um, some feedback I received about not giving out too much data. But um, the first year uh, that you see there was fairly low numbers of total counseling sessions. But that was the first year um, that I was doing it uh, myself. Um, and then you can see a steady increase. And then the final uh, bar on the right-hand side is this year so far, and we anticipate exceeding the numbers that we had before. Um, also, we, we showed this slide. And as you notice up above there, it says that um, we shared this with the Vice President and others, but basically it was the administrative folks, the Dean's Council and Vice Presidents and President. Uh, another thing is showing that we st stick to a a uh, short-term therapy model so that we're, you know, getting people in and served and people that may need extensive services would be um, referred out to local community centers and counseling centers, which there aren't many in our community, but there are some. And then we also show the no-show -so percentage, so students who make an appointment but don't attend and uh, are actually our percentages are, are pretty good. Uh, you see in 2011 and 12 it was 15.4 percent, which is which is probably around the average for counseling centers. Um, and then we implemented a texting service where we reminded them of their appointments and made a point of it in our sessions to tell them about the importance of attendance. And uh, they were able to cut that down by quite a bit. And that's that's pretty much it, I guess. The to sum it up is that the, the call center and the support line and our counseling services work together to reach out to students and um, in a way that kind of receives or is open to them where they are. And that is probably isolated, unfortunately, in their apartments and things like that. Um, but it gave us great opportunities to, to share this information in statistical form with our higher administration. And thankfully, there are a great bunch of people who supported us and, and provided additional funding for us. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, so, operator, please unmute the phone lines. Um, are there any questions for Alan? You can either ask them verbally or you can chat them in. Um, and, you know, while Alan was talking, I asked if anyone else is doing any phone or text lines. And Regina from LaGuardia said, that um, she's partnering with the Sam Samaritans. Oh, no, sorry, Jackie said they're partnering with the Samaritans from UMass Lowell. Um, and Diana Kirby from Lipscomb also said they're partnering with the Samaritans on a crisis line. And um, Kate Simmons has a question for Alan. Alan, where does the funding come to sustain the text line? That's a great question, and it was one that we continually talked about from the time we started. Um, when we were showing the administrators the data, we we actually were hoping that they would increase a, a line item budget um, specifically for that and for the student paraeducators that we have. And we had a small budget that was already in, in place for the students to do prevention services, but they actually increased that uh, budget significantly following the grant period. And so it was just... Uh, in addition to our budget from the administrators. Great, fantastic, thank you. Um, any other questions for Alan? I'll give you guys a minute to either say it or text it in. Okay, well thank you so much, Alan. And again, we'll have his contact information along with Jackie's on the last slide uh, so you can reach out to him. So now we're going to talk a bit about next steps. So our next meeting is um, in April. You might say, Bonnie, why April? What happened to March? Um, well, we know that many of you go on spring break, 
um, and we didn't want this to be a, um, you know, a rush or anything. So we wanted to give a month break um, since you will, many of you will be away. And our next meeting will be April 24th. What we were hoping you, um, if possible, before your next meeting, or our next meeting, I should say, on April 24th, is to meet with your advisory council or your task force before um, our next meeting. And we thought this would be um, a good time to talk about topics you could plan to bring up to discuss. Um, you could talk about what you think we should sustain, uh, prioritizing, uh, what data could we show to, for the importance of suicide prevention, and identifying gaps in suicide prevention activities. Are there any other topics people are thinking um, that they could bring up for the, um, when they talk to their advisory council or task force, you could chat it in or say it verbally because the phone lines are still open. So I'm gonna just um, call on people because I am a jerk like that as we have already established. Um, so I'm gonna call on, um, on Courtney from Eastfield. Courtney, do you guys have a um, advisory council or task force? Yes, we do. Uh, we actually have one through our CARES program, um, which is, uh, it's, it's an alert program for our faculty and staff to share information about students who are at risk, um, and like behavioral risk. And so um, Katie Neff, who is our, who, she's also our licensed uh, personal counselor for uh, Eastville, actually started the initiative um, to have a separate task force under CARES that involves faculty, staff, HR, uh, the commander for the police department, the health department, as well as our Title IX um, deputy, who is also the one, uh, our dean of students. So we do have, we meet uh, monthly and uh, we talk about different issues that are, are related to suicide prevention, but right now we're, we're trying to um, establish our actual, um, what we need to do as a college because um, shame, shame, shame on us. We don't have a suicide, um, we don't have anything in writing for uh, suicide prevention or, or um, intervention. And so we are working on that and we're, uh, we're, we're kind of calling ourselves to task to make sure that we have everything in line. And I, I forgot, we also work with disability services. So we're trying to incorporate all these pieces in order to make sure that we, um, we're, we're doing things that are productive for our students. Thank you so much, Courtney. I appreciate it, especially because I realize I have been calling on you quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> no problem. And um, now I'm going to call on, I'm going to call on um, Camille Vega from Truckee Meadows. Um, Camille, if you're still on the line, can you tell me um, about, um, have you been meeting with your advisory council task force and, you know, what sort of things you've been talking about with them? Camille's line is disconnected. Oh, sorry, Camille. Um, so then I'm going to call on, um, how about um, Christina Mitt from Tennessee Tech? Can you tell us anything about your work with Advisory Council Task Force? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, we, we don't have a um, campus advisory suicide prevention council. We partner with the Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network, and we have a really good partnership with them. And there is a regional group that meets uh, monthly. And we, um, at our last meeting, were already um, partnering with them to set up a suicide prevention table at a, a suicide prevention 5K run that's coming up in March. So at our meetings, we typically do programming and then talk about how we can support each other. Fantastic, sounds like a great advisory council slash task force, whatever you want to call it. We, we call it many different names. And so also, we don't really have time to go into this, but I also hope all of you will think about um, after this call is who are some campus leaders you can get more engaged, either people you thought about that were at the table or weren't at the table. 
and hopefully you are inspired by the, the amazing list of people that uh, our participants are reaching out to. And also think about who are the essential people that need to be invested to, um, for your efforts to be successful. And of course, who is missing from the table? So I'm going to turn it over to Irene, who's going to talk a bit about um, homework, and we're going to wrap up. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so before I go over homework, just a reminder that all the homework are posted on the website dedicated for this webinar for um, your reference, so no need to frantically write this down. So homework for this time is a little unique. There is a sustainability podcast which is about seven minutes from Adams State University, posted on the private pages. The private pages are a private area of the SPRC website open to former and current grantees to share their materials along with any useful resources. So um, you need to be logged into the SPRC website to listen to this podcast. Just a note, um, all the project directors already have access to the private pages, so please go to the Request Your Password section to get your um, new password. For everyone else, if you don't have access to the private pages, please directly reach out to your prevention specialist at SPRC. Along with this podcast, please review the Action Alliance's framework for successful messaging. Both of these resources will help your team's effort to build momentum and foster leadership for sustainability. For those who have already complete, completed the member profile, thanks so much. If you haven't already completed the member profile, please send me or Bonnie the member profiles. And once again, the website has all the homework posted, and we have shared other useful resources under the homework tab, so we encourage you to check it out. Um, if you'd like to email any of the participants in between meetings, Bonnie sent out sustainability series participants' Excel spreadsheet with all the email addresses last Friday, so feel free to email any peers or speakers or Bonnie or me with any questions. And did anyone have any questions that you wanted to ask um, during this time? The line is open, so you can just speak up or chat in. Okay, seeing none, um, here's the contact information for all the speakers for today. Um, we thank you so much for um, joining today, and if you have any um, questions, we encourage you to talk with your own prevention specialist at SPRC about some of the concepts and ideas we've covered today and how it applies to your own unique grant project. And just some um, funding information about SPRC. We're also funded by SAMHSA, and views, opinions, and content covered today do not necessarily reflect the official position of SAMHSA. So once again, thank you so much for joining, and we hope you have a great start of the week. And feel free to reach out to us with any questions, comments, feedback. Feedback is always welcome, and we just want to be mindful of everyone's time. So at, these, at this time, we will end our um, session. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. And this does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. At this time, you may disconnect.